Good day, everybody. It is so good to be back with you. I've been out of action for a few weeks, um, but here we are back again. Uh, the title of this podcast is Coconut Christian. Now, I'll explain that in just a moment, but if you are interested in what bad Christianity looks like or have been exposed to fake Christians or you're wondering how Christians should be responding to the current woke culture, then uh, stick around. Maybe some things will be said today that might be beneficial to you. It is Friday, the 5th of November here in Durban, South Africa. Weather is great. Can you believe it? 2021 is almost finished. That uh, almost basically exactly two years since uh, COVID hit the world. Uh, this is uh, Fishing for Men with Mac, the name of this podcast where we talk about worldviews, truth, and the Christian response to current issues. This is episode 68. Thank you to all those who've, who've listened to it quite a few times. Uh, it doesn't sound like many, but it's quite a few hours of content and talking and research. But I see that it has just under 5,000 downloads on Podbean, and I celebrate that. Uh, thank you for listening in, of course. Only listen in if it adds value to your life and if it adds value to your quest to figure out the big questions of life. Now, without further ado, let me start by explaining the title. Coconut Christian. Now, here in South Africa, I don't know if this is a, a form of speech or a metaphor used in the States or other places in the world, but here in South Africa, um, I've come across this idea quite frequently. Um, if you are from South Africa, you would probably know what it is about. Uh, but for those who don't know, let, let me explain. So there's a different culture between African black people and white Western people. In South Africa, there's a cultural difference between African black people and Afrikaans white people, the Afrikaners, the, the guys who sort of implemented apartheid. There's, there's definitely a cultural difference. And I'm not going to say the one is good and the other one is bad. There's just a difference. And, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with cultures being different. I think differences should be celebrated. I think it's something cool that we need to hold on to. You know, the Zulu culture is different from the American Red Indian culture. It doesn't mean the one is better than the other. It just means that they do things differently. They like different things. They do different things. Now, of course, in South Africa, racism has been an issue, um, and some people will stretch this further than it needs to go, but um, let me just bring this together. So, so when an African befriends white people, white Western people, or Afrikaans-speaking people, or start adopting white culture, in other words, he start behaving more like, a, uh, according to the white culture, his black African friends would often call him a coconut, now, why a coconut? Well, a coconut is white on the inside, but brown on the outside. Now, do you get the gist of that? I hope you get the gist of that. So, the met it's, it's, it's almost the type of critique that uh, black folks would give their black friends who act like white people, who ad ad adopt too much of the white culture. Now, the metaphor is essentially saying, you look like a black African on the outside, but on the inside, you are like a white Western man. Okay, now for some people, this is obviously something that carries bad connotations. Um, you know, the idea that you are an African, but you act like a white Western person. Uh, so, can you sort of, as I'm saying this, make the connection to coconut Christian? Now, when I say coconut Christian, I'm talking about two types of Christians. You need to listen up carefully to... To grasp this. Firstly, those who are Christians inside, but don't look like it on the outside. That's one type of Christian. And these are usually Christians that I call coward Christians. They deeply believe that Jesus is real, that God is real. They believe in Jesus. Hey, they probably even go to church, but they won't stand up for truth. When people criticize Jesus in their presence, they won't really say anything. And, and when, when people talk about current issues like, for example, the transgender debate or when somebody in their presence says, yeah, homosexuality is just fine, they won't stand up and say, no, actually sin is sin and that's not really correct. 
In a way, they are shy of Jesus. They easily adapt to the ways of the world. And so they, they're the type of people that would rather keep the world happy and think like the world in their presence and hide Jesus in their hearts. That's a type of coconut Christian. They, they, they are Christian inside, but they don't look like it on the outside. But there's another type of Christian, coconut Christians. Those who look like Christian on the outside, but aren't on the inside. They look like Christian on the outside, but they aren't on the inside. And these are common fake Christians. To them, Christianity is a culture. It's not an eternal truth. And so they do the Christian thing. They speak the Christian lingo. But inside, they haven't really been born again. They don't know Jesus. They maybe grew up in a in, in, in a house where Jesus was worshipped. They grew up in a family where Jesus is the in thing. They went to church, the traditional church, every Sunday. But, you know, when it comes down to it, Jesus isn't real to them. And when they reach a point in their lives where they really have to test between, uh, to, to, to choose between Jesus and what they feel like doing, they usually choose the way that they feel over Jesus. You won't really see this type of person read his Bible privately or pray in private because Jesus is non-existent outside of public eye. But in the public, in the public, they will, you know, they will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you ask them, what are you? They will say, no, no, I'm a Christian. But if you look at their lives, definitely they are not. Now, keep these ideas in mind. You know, I'll go back to them and just tell you what sort of stimulated me into doing this, uh, this podcast. Let me give you an example of one of such people that came across in my um, life to give you sort of the scenario. So my boy had this, this friend at school. And when I say school, I'm talking about pre-primary school that kept on saying things like boys can marry boys. And he sang songs about kissing my boy. Now, yo, if you're listening to this and you've got a boy um, and your boy is four years old or five years old and you hear about another boy at that age hitting on your boy. Yo, I don't know how you feel about that, but for me, that is a very big problem now for many people in our world they would say well what is what is the problem homosexuality is normal man it's part of life well yeah you see this is where the issue comes in whether you're a real christian and whether you're not whether you're a coconut christian or not now why is this such a big problem now i'm going to just sketch to you my feelings and my scenario first of all um, I want my kids to know and understand God's creation design of male and female. I want my kids to understand that, that God created male and female to complete each other. Okay, he, didn't cre he created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay, secondly, I've met people who practiced homosexuality because they were socially influenced at age four. I've told you this before. Your children are just highly um they can they can be influenced so easy at age four. What that kid is doing now could mislead my kid and alter the course of his life and cause him many problems later on in his life if my kid um, grabs onto that. The third reason, kids are highly influenceable below age of six. Now, I've just mentioned that. I mean, they are like little sponges. Um, they will soak up any form of influence. And I don't want influence around my kid that is not godly. Number four, society is trying to normalize the abnormal. And I don't want my kid to be exposed to that type of wokeness already at pre-primary school. My, my kid's going to have to deal with this world for the next 70 years if God spares him those, those many years. Well, you know, he's not even five years old yet and this is already pushed down his throat. This is already from a, another four-year-old um, pushed down his throat. And fifthly, which is also a big concern, the school that my kids go to is a Christian school. Supposed to be. But now it seems more like a coconut Christian school. I mean, they call themselves on the website a Christian school, but the people who are inside the school are definitely not Christian. And so on the outside, you don't see what happens on the inside. Now, anyways, we, we also spoke to the, his teacher about this, and the teacher could also identify, yes, this is, this is the kid that seems to be uh, going in that direction. And um, eventually we met the parents, not because of that. We just started um, not to confront the issue. We just somehow or another, they crossed our path and we became friends. And, and, and I think it's because our boys are best buddies. Now, um, 
So we became friends with him. But in a few conversations with him, we started picking up what is going on. Because obviously if a kid at four years old is saying these types of things, it's cool, then surely it comes from the house. And so these people, the parents, they say they are Christians. And once again, I know that you can, you can pick up, they say they're Christians, but they're probably coconut Christians, right? So they say they're Christians, yet at the same time, they told us things like they teach their, their boy that, yes, boys can marry boys. Um, it's what's happening in the world. But you know what? They would really actually like it if he does one day marry a girl. But if not, they would still love him and, and everything would be fine. And so what they're teaching their child is, you know, don't worry. You know, homosexuality is basically, the homosexuality is just as normal as heterosexuality. Male and females, fine. Female, female, that's fine. They're teaching him at age four this. Okay, um, but you know it, it, it's their preference if he marries a girl. Obviously, maybe because they want to, you know to have kids one day, or, you know grandkids or whatever. But you know they're not really making this an issue. But they are Christian, by the way. You know we told them what we do. You know we make disciples, and they sort of said, yeah, yeah, that that shouldn't be done. Nobody should be, you know, you shouldn't be going around telling people to become Christians. You should you shouldn't be teaching people the gospel. I mean you. You know, that, that's, that's, that's not Christianity is. That's not what Christian Christians do. Now, we sat and listened to this. And what are you picking up? None of what they say comes from the scriptures. They cannot quote one apostle that said what they said. They cannot quote one verse, one line from the mouth of Jesus that supports what they say. In actual fact, I can guarantee you, and, and I love them, I can, but I can guarantee you that they never read the Bibles. Yet they call themselves Christians. Well, what has happened? How did they end up here? How can you call yourself a Christian, but you don't, you don't hold the worldview and the teachings and the truths of the Christian scriptures? Well, they don't want to deny Christianity. That's for sure. So they will always say they're Christians because it is maybe part of their past or it's part of their roots. But they, they believe the public opinion should direct their truth. That's essentially what it is. And I picked that up very, very quickly. In popular social culture, transgenderism is fine and normal and should be celebrated. Homosexuality is not sin. It is simply an allowed preference. And this is just one example in my life of a coconut Christian. And so what these people do is they listen to, they've been so influenced by popular culture, by movies, by what is said out there, um, by what is debated at universities, that they've bought into the idea that what the Bible says is not really truth or they don't even know what the Bible says. But what pub popular public opinion is, that is indeed the truth. And they've shaped their worldview around it. And their worldview is filtrated down to their kid. And their kid is trying to filtrate this into the mind of my kid. And so they claim to be Christian on the outside, but in the inside they don't really believe in Jesus and what he said. Because they don't even go check what he said. Now this is becoming more and more common. People believe in Jesus, but they also agree with the world. They also agree with popular opinion. I like Jesus. I really do, they would say. But I don't agree with what he says. I like Jesus. I think he was a great guy, you know. But to say that homosexuality is sin, I mean, to, to love somebody of the same sex, you know, is God condemning that love? You get where this is going. What Jesus says is fine. As long as it doesn't oppose popular social constructs. As long as Jesus agrees with my transgenderism and he agrees with my ideas of sexuality, um, no, then everything is fine. Now, let me be frank. This is the worst type of Christianity. When people call Jesus Lord but don't do what he says and rather choose to do what the world says, that is a big problem. That is the worst type of Christian. But how does this happen? How do people end up here? How do... People end up being such a mixed breed, half Christians. I submit to you that this has been God's biggest problem with these people since the beginning. Let me give you two examples. And it's interesting how this falls in line with my experiences and what I've been teaching the church in the States over the last few weeks. Um, I've started a sermon series called Strange Scriptures, Bad Interpretations, and you might have come across this, um, this text before. If you go read Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the idea that the sons of God came down, intermarried, and it didn't come down, but they intermarried the daughters of men, saw that they were beautiful, and started having children with them. And then it says in those days, the, the Nephilim was on the earth, and they were sort of giants. 
And then it goes on to tell about how how wicked the human race had become and, and how ungodly people had become that God said, look, I'm going to destroy the whole world. I'm going to destroy every living human being. And the text says that God was grieved that he had created mankind. And there's this big debate that that's going around that, that people are bringing up saying that w- what happened here was is that there were humans humans on the earth okay and then angels from heaven came and they saw that human women were beautiful and they intermarried with them and they had children with them and these children were the nephilim and they were giants and so i'm not going to go over that whole lesson um but you welcome to, if you would like to listen to that you, you're welcome to um uh, let me know and i can send you the link but I grapple with that and I ask the question, but is this the truth? And when you go actually study the text, you come to see it's actually not the truth. Angels didn't come down and and sleep with humans. Uh, Angels don't marry. I mean, Jesus said so in the book of Matthew. um, I think it was in chapter chapter 22. So in any case, so what is going on here? And if you go a a book earlier, a chapter earlier, you go to chapter 5 and chapter 4 and chapter 3 and you go see what happened. This is what happened. If you remember the story of, of what happened in the Garden of Eden and after the Garden of Eden, God allowed Eve to get pregnant and she had two boys, right? Cain and Abel. The one killed the other. What was his name? His name was Cain. So if you go read in Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 5, you read the story about, about Cain. And then you see that Cain was kicked out from God's presence. He had to leave. He had to, he had to go away. And the text says specifically he, could no, he, he was no longer going to walk with God. So, so you've got Cain there, separate. He's moved away from God. He's moved away from uh, Adam and Eve. He's gone on his own. And then you read just after that that Eve gave birth to a, another boy. And his name was Seth. And then the text says that when Seth started to increase, then people began to call on the name of the Lord. In other words, people started to worship God. So what you have is you've got two groups of people. You've got the children of Seth living uh, living with God, walking with God, worshiping God. And then the other corner of the world, a distance away, uh, far from the garden, the text says, well, east of the garden of Eden, you have then Cain with his family. And he's, he's, he's um, been excluded from God's presence. And so what you then find in Genesis chapter 6, when the text says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and married any of, any of them they chose, what that's talking about is that the sons of Seth saw the daughters of Cain were beautiful and started intermarrying with them. So what you find here is that God's people were intermarrying with pagan people. The children of Seth, they were not following God. They were excluded from God. They were not part of God's chosen folk. They were lost, cast out from God. And from the beginning, God wanted his people to be separated from unbelievers, to be separated from the wicked, to be separated from the ungodly, to be separated from those who murder, the sinners, the adulterers, the fornicators. So... What we see here in Genesis chapter 6, what the text is trying to tell us is that the world that becomes so wicked, listen carefully, the world that becomes so wicked that the followers of God, the descendants of Seth, had started, had given up their morality, had given up the truth of God and started intermarrying with the children of Cain, the murderer of Abel. And so the world, you know the world is getting really wicked when you see Christians adopt evil in the face of God's truth. So that's what we see already in Genesis chapter 6. One of the first problems that God had the unim- I mean, God was so upset about this that he said, I'm going to wipe mankind from the face of the earth. There's nothing that, that upsets God more than when his children are corrupted by the ways of evil. Then we, and he, by the way, here's the problem. Not because um, the children of Cain were like, and not human, not because they didn't love and they were monsters of some kind. No, that's not the problem. The problem was this. And the reason why God wanted them separate is because the children of Cain were not worshipping God. They were worshipping other gods. And by you intermarrying with them, you are then mixing, diluting your, um, your, your pure religion, your pure morality. You are, you are messing up your morality and that leads to eventual total destruction. And that's what happened in Genesis chapter 6. The, the text says that he, the, the human race was evil and wicked in the heart all the time. That is crazy. And how did that start? That started when solid believers and followers of God started to dilute 
their theology, their worldviews, their um, their morality, their religiosity through intermarrying with people who didn't believe in the same God as they did. And so um, I can give you many such examples. That's why when the Israelites were saved out of Egypt, God said to them, when you get to the promised land of Canaan, do not intermarry with the peoples there. And by the way, it is still exactly the same problem in Jerusalem and in Israel today. God said to them, drive these people out from the land. By the way, that is still the reason why it's the biggest issue, why Jerusalem is always fought over. Because you've got two different religions. It's not a political war, ladies and gentlemen. It's about two religions. The Muslims claim it's theirs. God already said thousands of years ago, if you don't drive these people out from the land of Israel, they're going to be a snare to you. And that's exactly what is still happening today. In any case, that's for, for another day. So it goes it goes on through through the... The entering of the promised land of Canaan, um, the the whole story in the book of Judges, all of it is about how to drive these pagan nations from the promised land of Canaan and not to intermarry with them and mix with them. Because the moment you mix with them, then you start adopting their cultures, their morality. Um, eventually, you will offer your children in the sacrifice to the fire, which is interesting. I'm sorry, I didn't even plan on saying this, but I mean, w what these Canaanites did was they would sacrifice their children in a fire to Molech, their, their babies. There wasn't really value placed on a baby life. You'd sacrifice that to the gods. And isn't it very interesting that in Egypt, the pagan king Pharaoh, what did he do? He wanted all the boys killed in Egypt. And isn't it interesting that when Jesus came into the world, King Herod also wanted the babies killed to prevent Jesus from coming into the world. When babies are being killed, you can be sure it's the work of Satan and it is evil and it is, it is, it is destructive. It is not from God. And isn't that interesting that that's one of the biggest debates in our world today about um, abortion? Now, let me tell you this. Those on the side of abortion, that is not from God. That is straight out of the mouth of, of Satan. It's always been that way right from the beginning. And so these people in Canaan, they were sacrificing their children in the fire to Molech. And God said to them, don't intermarry with these people because before you know it, you're going to think like they think and you're going to offer your children in the sacrifice to uh, in, in the fire. You're going to sacrifice your children in the fire to Molech. Any case. Eventually, the days of Ezra comes, and I've been teaching through the book of Ezra recently, and exactly the same thing happened. What happened eventually is that Judah and Israel, because they intermarried with the foreign peoples, and because they started adopting their worldviews and their religions, and they had male prostitutes on the shrines, and they had Asherah poles all over Israel. What happened was is that these people, these Canaanites, started to infiltrate Israel to, to affect their, their, their culture, their religion, their morality, to the point that God said exactly the same thing as in, in Genesis chapter 6. Okay, I'm going to destroy you guys. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to send the Babylonians. First, he sent the Assyrians to destroy the northern ten tribes. Then he brought the Babylonians and they conquered Jerusalem. They took off Judah and Benjamin and they dragged these Israelites into uh, Babylonia. And there they were held captive for 70 years, the exile. The Israelites were sent into captivity because they didn't stand their ground for God's truth, but allowed the cultures around them to influence their morality, their religiosity and their worldview. Now, I hope that you're starting to draw the line of what exactly is happening in our world today. In any case, God, through his mighty power, and this is one of the most amazing stories, through the king of Persia, Cyrus, and Darius, and Artaxerxes, he sends some of these Israelites back to Jerusalem and says, Okay, guys, you can go and rebuild the temple. You can go and reestablish yourself there. You can go also through Nehemiah, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Go reestablish your kingdom. And lo and behold, you know, it's the, one of the first things that they do. They start intermarrying again with the people who live around Jerusalem and who are not faithful followers of God. You see, right through, there's this issue that we cannot separate ourselves and ignore the religiosity and the morality and the worldviews of the world around us. In both these stories, in, in, in the case of Genesis chapter 6, in the case of Ezra, a fundamental truth emerges. 
God doesn't want Christians to mingle and mix with the world and its ideas because it waters down God's will for his people. In other words, God despises coconut Christianity. And one of the best grounds to become a coconut Christian is university. It's a breeding ground to mess with your mind. It's like taking an Israel Israelite and let him go live in a Canaanite city, the Perizzites, for example, to go live with them for 10 years and see if he's not going to come out of there and worship their God. It is like, make up your mind. This is, the, I mean, I think this is what God is calling for. He's like, make up your mind. Be a Christian inside and outside or don't be one at all. Stand up for what Jesus says, even if 99% of the world disagrees with him. Jeremiah preached for 40 years and not one person repented. He was surrounded by people who never agreed with him. But he, the text says that his head was flint. He would walk through a wall, but he wouldn't submit to the popular dominant culture that surrounded him. Or, you, you know, so, so it's like, stand up for what Jesus says, even if 99% of the world disagrees with you. Or join the 99% of the world and keep Jesus out of your mouth and your life. But don't mix up your priorities and your allegiances. You cannot serve both God and the world. You cannot hold on to the teachings of Christ and the popular teachings of society. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is going crazy. It's going crazy. And I think the craziness is starting especially in the States. Men are not men anymore. And You know, I, I heard last week from uh, in a lesson that apparently this week, um, they launched the first passport that where the gender is non-binary. Uh, the first non-binary passport in America. They've just legitimately, the government of America has just, has just legally stated that they believe, the government believes, that human beings are not separated between male and female. You can now be they, there, I don't know what else. But male and female is no longer the truth it's no longer the norm so men are not men anymore women aren't women anymore homosexuality has been normalized thoroughly i mean there's there isn't one i mean it, it's not even a strange thing to see homosexuality in tv shows it's it's been normalized okay transgenderism is no longer gender dysphoria it's no longer a problem that that, that needs to be addressed um the family structure is now something unnatural that needs to be broken down or dismantled as the bl BLM movement says, you know, in the past, I mean, just 10 years ago, the nucleus of the family was important and most people understood that. Now most people are turning against the family structure, trying to dismantle it. Children can say what gender they, they are long before their brains are fully developed. And what do you think all of this is leading to? This is leading to a broken world. This evil is increasing. Our children will grow up in it. One day, cisgender will be strange to people. Do you know what cisgender is? Normal heterosexual relationships, male and female. One day, cisgender will be strange to people. People will find it strange when they see a male say, yes, I'm just a male. <laughs> and a female say, yeah, I'm just a female. We just, we're just seeing the beginning of this. And homosexuality will be a normal part of all relationships. And as soon as all these woke ideas have been normalized in society, we will be living in a global Sodom and Gomorrah. Brothers and sisters, we are turning into a global Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what happened there? God burnt down the abomination. But something else happened that was really good if you look at that story. The good was separated from the bad. The good that held on to the wisdom and the morality of God, they were saved from that destruction. Lot and his family, they could flee to the mountains. There was a separation between good and evil. And this is also why I say it is very good if the world becomes more evil and full of sin. It will force people to decide where they stand. Either we stay in the, stay in the city of Sodom and be destroyed or we move out from it and we will live. The more wicked the world becomes, the more coconut Christians will disappear. A wicked, woke and evil society will force people to either be real Christians and be cast out. Or to not be Christians at all and survive and live in a wicked society that leads to destruction. In other words, in such a time and place, the choice will be much harder for people. Choose Christ, be imprisoned, cast out or killed. Or don't choose Christ, choose the world's worldview, live well in sin, but lose your soul and face God ultimately for your abomination. 
Now, what would I like to leave with you? Choose properly. Choose properly. In the days of Moses and the days of Elijah, God told the people, This day I put life and death in front of you. Now choose. Either you believe and trust what Jesus said and his apostles said, that walked with him, or you choose popular culture. But please don't mix up the two because God despises it when you mix up the two. The worst thing for Christianity is coconut Christians. Go all in or go all out. Even if things don't make sense to you, trust God. We are finite. The scriptures are thousands of years old. Don't think YouTube and Facebook videos and people on the other side of the world know what they are talking about or hold the altar of truth. Truth is not created or or established through democracy. Let that sink in. It doesn't matter if a billion people on earth believe homosexuality is fine. It still doesn't change the truth of God. Wide is the gate and narrow the, uh, uh, and, and wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrows the ga- gate, narrows the road that leads to eternal life. In other words, many people will follow the lie. Crowds are doomed. Clearly, it is not the majority that holds to the truth. And unfortunately... The biggest reason why there are many coconut Christians is because people hold on to what the crowd says and not what God says. In actual fact, most of them don't even know what God says. Romans 12, 17 says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Be very careful. Just because everybody thinks it's right doesn't mean that it is right. Only Lot and his family were saved, if you remember. The whole city was destroyed. I mean, Lot could have been wrong, no, he could have, but he was right. When God destroyed the world through the flood, only eight people survived. The masses were wrong. Don't let the masses fool you. Secondly, if you easily deny Jesus, you are not with him. I say that with respect and love. He said, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. Don't be scared to say homosexuality is sin. Don't be scared to say that. And obviously don't say it in a way that makes... That makes it sound or or makes people think that you dislike homosexuals. Say it in a way that you love people because that's the truth. You love people. You want what's best for them. And it is the truth. That homosexual behavior causes more diseases. It is the truth. That homosexuality causes more psychological issues. And the reason was because it's not natural. We've been created that way. It blocks procreation. It just doesn't. It just doesn't work. It is sin. So don't be scared to say homosexuality is sin, that transgenderism is not the norm, that the nucleus of the family is good for us, that men must lead their families and protect their families with the strength God has given them, that women have wombs, there are women, wombs they have, that makes them the best incubators to bring forth life into the world and to nurture children. There's nothing shameful about that. We don't have to apologize that God created women to be nurturers and to carry wombs so they can carry children. We need to stand up for Jesus and stand up for truth. And if, you, if you're not willing to say these things and stand up for it, you're not worth Jesus. Because you're opposing the very creation, the very the, the, the very person, God of the universe, who's got the pipe pay- Patent right on the human race. Number three, be excited about the increase of wickedness. Don't be scared. A lot of Christians are scared. Well, it's getting so wicked. You know, it's horrible when it gets wicked. But I'm trying to just be positive here. Wickedness, ultimate wickedness, a world, when you're in a world surrounded by paganism, it will show you what you are made of. It will show you what you're made of. It will, it, it will test you and say, well, are you going to follow the crowd and like the rest or are you going to follow Jesus even when nobody else does? They say if you want to see what is in a tea bag, put it in hot water. If you want to see what is in someone, if you want to see if Christ is there or not, whether the person is real or not, whether their faith is real or not, then put them in a world where wickedness is all over and it becomes very hard to be a Christian. And then you will see who the truly committed, sold out followers of Jesus are. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've got difficult days lying ahead. And each person will increasingly face the challenge of, am I going to stand up for Jesus? Or am I going to submit to popular culture and let that influence my morality and worldview? 
which will eventually lead to the destruction of the human race and the wrath of God. May God bless you. Love you all lots. Have a fantastic week. Talk again next week.